You're watching the Alistair Rain, Armed Conflict Channel, covering the war on terrorism, human rights, world politics, and military events. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Secretary of State John Kerry and Leonardo DiCaprio. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you had a great lunch, and thank you for helping to make uh, the morning as stimulating and informative uh, as it was. Uh, you know, how come all the cameras are out now? You didn't do this when I was here earlier. I hope. Oh, I know a lot of you uh, first came to know Leonardo DiCaprio <laughs> as an image on a screen playing this uh, marvelous romantic lead uh, in a marine environment which included a certain iceberg and it didn't turn out so well. But he recovered from that as actors uh, do recover and uh, took on a lot of different roles. A very fast talking, powerful con man, legendary FBI director, professional thief of dreams, and a brawling frontiersman with a memorable appetite. Uh, he's played extraordinary roles, but one thing I know, because I've really gotten to know him pretty well, and we've been able to hang together on a few occasions and plot uh, environmental endeavors, uh, is that uh, he's a genuine article when it comes to really caring about being involved in and working for the environment. Uh, he has a new documentary that he's been working on for three years, uh, which just opened the Toronto Film Festival and was it's called Before the Flood. It's on climate change, and it is uh, uh, apparently a knockout, which received a prolonged uh, standing ovation at the end of the film. And he has used uh, these cinematic skills that he has, both in front of the camera and behind the camera, uh, to advance the cause that brings us all here today. When I invited him to the inaugural uh, conference of, of Our Oceans, uh, not only did he turn up and be there and make comments, but he delivered. He, he came and he put up millions of dollars uh, for protection that helped to, to set aside and protect some 772,000 square miles of vulnerable marine territory, and we're very grateful for that. Uh, he has met with leaders in various countries, uh, worked with Bill Clinton, uh, President Clinton, and, and, and Pope Francis on the issue of climate change, encouraging them to act. And uh, I know uh, comes here with a uh, commitment. His, his uh, foundation is given to conservation efforts in over 40 countries in the world over the years. And he's been working uh, steadily uh, for more than a decade uh, on all of these issues. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, without further ado, welcome with me uh, the latest uh, Best Actor Award winner uh, and committed environmental activist, Leonardo DiCaprio. Thank you, Secretary Kerry, for that unbelievable introduction and for your leadership on such a vital issue facing all of our future. I was with you, as you stated, for the very first Our Oceans Conference two years ago, and since then this group, with your visionary leadership, has accomplished so very much. This conference has become a true platform for action. As a group, we have galvanized unprecedented action for our oceans, protecting millions of square kilometers, an area more than twice the size of India. We've elevated these issues to a global stage and we've educated our leaders and the public on how much our climate, food security, economic security, and ultimately our future on this planet depends on the health of our oceans. It's critical that we keep this momentum up, though, because the future of our oceans continues to be challenged by an astonishingly long list of threats. Warming waters, acidification, 
plastic pollution, methane release, drilling, overfishing, and the destruction of marine ecosystems like coral reefs are pushing our oceans to the very brink. This year, Australia's Great Barrier Reef suffered what is thought to be the largest bleaching event ever recorded. Over 600 miles of reef previously teeming with life is devastated. We are seeing this level of impact of coral reefs around the world from Hawaii to the Florida Keys, from Madagascar to Indonesia. I saw it with my own eyes filming the new film Before the Flood, which chronicles the impacts of climate change. Marine scientist Jeremy Jackson led me underwater in a submersible to observe the reefs off the coast of the Bahamas, and what I saw took my breath away. Not a fish in sight, colorless, ghost-like coral, a complete graveyard. This is the state of the majority of the world's coral reefs, and it is a sobering reality. We've destroyed irreplaceable ecosystems, reversing half a billion years of evolution. I also recently visited Palau and met with the leaders of Kiribati, two island nations in the South Pacific that are feeling the impacts of a warming climate right now. Houses are being abandoned because of the rising tides. Whole communities face an uncertain future as their islands shrink, waters closing in around them. The nation of Kiribati is already preparing for the unprecedented relocation of their people, having purchased land in Fiji to accommodate an almost certain migration from their home. These nations are also dependent on the health of the seas for their economic survival. Tuna is the number one source of income in Kiribati. To prevent a collapse of the, this fishery, Kiribati created a marine sanctuary the size of California. They understand that protecting nature, giving it a chance to rebound and replenish, is the key to protecting the future of their nation, their culture, and their people. We need more leaders and communities to take bold actions like this. As a global community, we must protect and value vital marine ecosystems rather than treating the oceans as an endless resource to be exploited and as a dumping ground for our waste. Oceans absorb about a third of the carbon we pump into the atmosphere, but we've pushed it way too far. The ocean can no longer keep up with our rampant rate of carbon dioxide emissions. Today our seas are warmer, warmer and far more acidic, weakening the shells of marine creatures and destroying coral reefs that we all depend on for life. The only way we can avert this disaster is by innovative uh, scaling up innovative uh, actions and solutions to these problems as quickly as possible. One solution that is poised to address global overfishing and illegal fishing is a new platform called Global Fishing Watch. This innovative technology is the result of a powerful partnership that leverages the unique skills of each participating organization. Google's ability to organize big data and inform and make it universally accessible SkyTruth's ability to use satellites to monitor threats to the planet, and Oceana's ability to execute winning campaigns to bring back fishery abundance. Today, this unprecedented technology is available to everyone in the world. I encourage everyone to go check it out here in the watch room and on your own devices as you soon can get globalfishingwatch.org right in your hand. This platform will empower citizens across the globe to become powerful advocates for our oceans. With the data Global Fishing Watch provides governments, fishery management organizations, researchers, and the fishing industry can work together to rebuild fisheries and protect critical marine habitats. We encourage all of you to take advantage of this new technology and work together to effectively monitor and protect our seas. Another critical issue is the global crisis facing sharks and rays. In recent years, markets for shark fin, liver oil, cartilage, leather, meat, and ray gill plates have surged, while conservation efforts have failed to keep pace. As a result, it is estimated that 100 million sharks are killed annually, with over 90% of the population declined for some species, and nearly a quarter of all species are now facing extinction. The Global Partnership for Sharks and Rays is a coalition working to halt the overexploitation of these species, reverse their decline, restore populations, and prevent extinctions. This collaborative effort 
which is close to me personally, is also supported by the Paul M. Angel Foundation, the Helmsley Charitable Trust, Oceans 5, and the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation. We joined together to develop a global strategy to stop the slaughter of sharks and rays and to ramp up resources to change the tide for these incredible and important species. These initiatives are great examples of what can be achieved when the right partners come together to solve these challenging problems. Partners like all of you. There are many other exciting solutions and game-changing commitments that will be shared over the next two days. Among them are President Obama's incredible announcement just a few weeks ago to create the largest protected area on the planet in and around the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Let's give him a round of applause for that. And then again today, the President announced the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts Marine National Monument, an important marine ecosystem off the coast of Cape Cod. This is exactly the kind of bold leadership that we all need more of. I am truly inspired by this group of people and all that you have done collectively to protect our oceans since the first conference two years ago. But my hope is that this is just the very beginning. The great ocean explorer Jacques Cousteau once said, the sea, once it casts its spell, holds one in its net of wonder forever. That is true for me. I, suspect, I suspect it is true for each one of you. But there will be no wonders for our children and our grandchildren to behold unless we step up and push ourselves to go bigger, to be bolder, and to take action now to protect our oceans <laughs> before it is too late. Thank you very much. management strategies that we have today were really developed thousands of years ago by the Pacific Islanders. Things like closed areas, closed seasons for spawning, minimum size limits. Somebody would say like, oh, he's a fisherman. Is he a good fisherman? And the definition of a good fisherman is not somebody who goes out there and harvests everything, but a successful fisherman is somebody who goes out there and takes care of the ocean while harvesting from the ocean. In the years since the rise of global commercial fishing, 90% of fish stocks have been fished at or above their maximum sustainable yield, proving a desperate need for global sustainable fishery management. For years, we've been puzzling over the problem of showing people what's happening way offshore, out of sight, or underneath the surface of the water. And we stumbled across a system of radio frequency broadcasts that can be intercepted by satellites to take all of the commercial fishing activity in the ocean and put it on a map for everybody to see. Strengthened by satellite-assisted monitoring, international partnerships have grown, sharing data on shared fish stocks. Before we were acting individually, we were not seeing, we were not knowing. Now, the only way you can fish in our EZ is to be compliant, be legal, and then we can cooperate in a sustainable fishing. Following in the footsteps of successful regional partnerships, shared management of shared fish stocks went global with the ratification of the Port State Measures Agreement by 36 parties covering 62 countries and the partnerships of the Safe Ocean Network. Agreeing shared frameworks for global fishery management rewarding the good fishermen and taking bold collective steps forward toward the rhythms of our sustainable past.
we in the West are just starting to realize the frailty and, and the finiteness of, of the ocean. When you decide that this is your priority, it must be reflected throughout the system. It's our life. The ocean is our life.